This is the Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 44 of 100. Today on the show, I have none other than Richard Brimmer, photographer and all-round creative genius, and we're going to be talking about the creative process around photography and how technology has changed that, um, as well as some of the things that really make up your photos and make them unique, Richard. Um, your subjects uh, are wide and varied over the years, um, but I want to start with something that I think captures everyone when they look at a photo, uh, and that's when you see other people in a shot. Um, what first got you into portrait photography? Uh, I suppose my early, well, my early days were weddings and portraits. Um, my background, I started off at aerial mapping, I left school at 16 and did an apprenticeship at New Zealand Aerial Mapping and part of that course I had to go and work for a photographer which I did, I worked for a guy in Hastings who was, who was a very traditional but an absolute um, master at light like he was had Maori actually and it, <clears throat> he was amazing with light so I probably worked with him at weekends doing weddings and portraits and whatnot for about three years and learnt a lot but it probably wasn't the direction I really wanted to go to at a young age you're sort of thinking fashion and all the cool stuff not yeah. chasing brides around or doing babies and um, that sort of got me going um, yeah and then, then I, <coughs> I sort of obviously once my apprenticeship was finished I did a bit of travelling and, and whatnot. then set up my own business in Havelock North and that was mainly wedding portrait sort of work um, but I'd always do my own sort of stuff and sort of yeah just enjoy I, I've always been intrigued by people and in, in all walks of life it's always been a, a passion of mine I've, I, I buy a lot of photographic books it's one of my my probably downfalls but I, I do look at a lot of a lot of magazines and books and that's probably where I've got a lot of inspiration for what I'm doing yeah um, and it was crazy back in the old days because probably going to a public school you meet all the wrong people and um, I'd have my studio in Havelock North and a couple of my school buddies had definitely gone the wrong way and they were in Highway 61 and they'd sort of come into my shop and drag me into the, the pad at sort of every Thursday night for the drinks and whatnot so you sort of had the Havelock photographing Havelock babies and, and doing all the Havelock weddings and every Thursday night you'd be in the Highway 61 pad yahooing and being a drunkard and it's, it's sort of an, it was an interesting um, way of life really but did you that, find that, that that juxtaposition between the two actually helped with either the creative process or being able to photograph a, a wide spectrum of, of society? Well, I think deep down I probably wanted to be a war... I had visions of love to be a war correspondent and that whole, you know, getting amongst it. So probably in Hastings, being in a gang pad is as close as I was going to get, <laughs> especially with a studio in Havelock North. So, um, yeah, that was probably my beginnings. And I've, I've always been intrigued with people that are... Um, just have a different take on life. And uh, I've photographed all sorts of... God, all sorts of people from probably most of the gang and you know the black power I've, I've photographed those guys for about 20 odd years and bits and pieces of mongrel mob through guys I've gone to school with and I just sort of kept that friendship up or that relationship up and have been able to go and photograph them and their families and and be accepted by them um, what does that tell you about the the, the gang scene over that period of time because you, you must have oh, back through in, photos back you're in tracking the, yeah it's, it's probably obviously different now because you know back in those days it was just beer drinking and now it's just a whole different scene but yeah, which is obviously not me but um, yeah back in those days it was reasonably safe and it would uh, be a different scene now that's for yeah. sure yeah I guess back then it was more it was the family away from family that didn't exist yeah. and a way for people to connect um, and show that they were part of that alternative style of family, albeit that not necessarily accepted by society. Yeah. It was a, well, it was a big family. You, you know, um, 
I know black power is sort of a little bit like that, but yeah, it's, it, I've sort of probably always been intrigued by the dark side maybe, and um, recently I, I worked on a film, I do a lot of film work, and I do the stills, and and it was a shoot in, um, in Wellington, it was on, um, and Carmen, she, she, her part was played out, so we had a whole lot of transvestites from Wellington, or transgender I suppose is the right term now. Um, uh -huh. And we had there was maybe ten of them that were brought on set, and it, it, you know we had them there for about two weeks, and I ended up getting quite matesy with them. And then next thing you're out at Upper Heart and in the house and the, in the state house, and it, it was just yeah, amazing to. Do you find that having that camera around your neck gives you access to places and environments? But it also, but it also can be a barrier. You've got to be a little bit careful there because people. You know, and especially with social media now, you've got that, um, you know, everything's sort of live. Yeah. So some people want to keep it private, but they definitely didn't. So I've got some great photographs and great portraits, and I'm keen to go back and shoot. You know, I, I quite like, I, my style is probably quite traditional. I'm not a great Photoshopper, or I try to keep things as I see them. What I see in my head is what I like my photograph to to be um, so my my probably my camera equipment portrays that I, I shoot with a Hasselblad and a Leica as best I can and that are sort of fairly traditional cameras and they are tripoded and and quite composed but um, that's a style I really like. Do you find that when you're you know walking around just minding your own business in a scene or do do photos appear in front of you and you have to stop and, and capture it? I, I try and have my camera around my neck, my, you know, probably 90% of the... Uh, I, I've always got a camera with me and I do see photographs and things like that. But I also look at a lot of... and Instagram's an interesting one. I, I scroll through that every morning and I um, look at Hasselblad or like of shoot photographers and you see stuff and you think, God, I could do that in Hastings, or I could do that in Napier. You know, you sort of, and you start looking for those shots, which is probably could be called copying, but it's I'm sure you're just basically converting what you've seen into your life, and which where you get those creative influences yeah, from. Exactly. And I think the, yeah. the beauty of, in particular, of Instagram is the you know the visual nature of it, and the access to people that you aspire to be or you enjoy you know, mm. consuming their work it's all there yeah, um, yeah. from all around the world and yeah because i do remember you saying to me about five years ago you should be doing and i wasn't on facebook <laughs> instagram or anything and saying you should be doing this it's you and um I thought, oh, yeah sure and <laughs> yeah who's this little social media upstart that thinks he knows everything <laughs> exactly and the next thing i'm fully addicted i'm just totally every morning you know up at five in the morning it's going through all the yeah so yeah, I, I find it it's quite a it's become i've always bought photo books because i really like ph photography books because you can sort of I, I just like to look and feel a paper you know it is a not really nice um it's a great way to view photographs. Like a computer's good, but I think paper is, if you can get it right in a book, you've got it right. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean, I agree. I think, um, you know, when you're looking at something in the stream, there's actually a lot of distractions around, so you can't fully appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's something different when it's backlit from when the, it's a tactile experience. I think yeah. it goes back to how our brains are wired yeah. way before technology and computers. Yeah. Um, so then how, how do you go about making sure that you know, your photos get into books and in the right books and in the right places? Um, Self-publishing is a good way of doing it. I, I, a lot of the books, it's only lately, um, the last two, or yeah, the last two books I've done have been done via publishers. So I've been commissioned to shoot. Um, prior to that I did the Cranford Hospice book, which was basically a, a big thank you for what they did with with jo our Joseph, um, for your son, yeah. But yeah, it's um, it's nice to have a little bit of control. I know the with the Cranford book, I, was, I I could sort of choose the photographs and probably keep an eye on the printing and stuff like that. When you're dealing with a big publisher, you're sort of at the lap of the gods, really, for quality. But I, I work with Random House in Auckland, and they're very good. Yeah, later the Pippi book we've just done recently, and okay. Yeah, 
mm. that Cranford uh, book, yeah. you set yourself a bit of a challenge uh, in that you didn't take your time taking these photos. There was something like 24 wineries in 24 hours? Was it 48? Oh, the, oh no, that's, that the, something separate? that's separate. That's for the charity wine auction, which um, I, I do the catalogue for Cranford for... for for the, that's my little donation every year, and um, I decided to ch because there were I think there's 30 odd wineries, or at that stage there was. I thought rather than stretching it out over two weeks and running around like a madman, I'll shoot it over vintage and do the whole lot in 24 hours. And we're going to like put the time at the bottom of each photograph, and you know, and start with the big ones who do you know run 24 hours, and then shoot the smaller ones who are. You know, during the day, and had this massive plan, and um, so I think we started at Vitals, and old Hugh, poor old Hugh, had to get up. Well, he had to be <laughs> like six or five a.m. Oh no, no, it was like two a.m. Oh it was really? Yeah, yeah, it was it was really early, and um, then we went to Church Road, I think it was. Yeah, we sort of start. Anyway, we we got got through it and finished it at eleven o'clock the next night. We did it in a twenty-four hour period, so we shot every winery in Hawkes wow. Bay, and we just drove like madmen and I think I had my daughter out, Anna, my daughter, she was with me and a, another friend and yeah, we sort of had turns at driving because we sort of then started having a few drinks at each way, <laughs> so, <laughs> ended up needing a driver in the end, but we, got, we did it, but yeah, it's, um, that, that was good fun, I like little projects like that where you sort of set almost the impossible goal and nail it, and the photos, they, they were actually really good because it showed from dark to light yeah. to dark. I think that's the beauty of, of putting some constraints around the creative process. It yeah. requires you to focus on something and get the best out. Uh, whereas the opposite, when there's no constraints, yeah. it, it doesn't have that same direction necessarily. Yeah, and I, I sort of quite like, well, I do like challenging myself. I try, I try and take at least one photograph for myself a day. Um, and maybe Instagram or Facebook has been good for that because it gives you a, what am I going to put up tomorrow sort of thing. But I probably well before that I've always done a photographer I worked for in Auckland when I was young, I was very young. Um, he said you've got to treat photography like a sport. You you have to practice it and you need to take photographs for yourself to and set goals or challenges to yourself so you can um, you've got to learn from each picture and you know whether it be good or bad um, you learn something. So, so you're, you've actually got your own creative timeline going on, interspersed with the client work that yeah. you get to do. Yeah. So where's your where is your timeline at now? Where have you just come from the last few years, and where you're kind of kind of going at the um, moment? Interesting, because I, I've I've probably just gone through quite an interesting period because I bought bought this Leica M, which is a traditional. It's a beautiful Leica camera. It's it's digital, but it's very hard to use. And probably part of me wanted to challenge myself. And I thought, well, what I'm going to try and do is use this camera for all. I will use the Hasselblad, which is a total high-end camera, and then try and knock out the DSLR, my Canon, and swap it with the Leica, and do all my creative work on that. So it's I had two two ends of the spectrum probably photographically but that was a bit of a fail because um, the like is just a little bit too tricky to use in a, in a quick situation like it's, it's a real thinking camera and you can't if you're on a shoot for for instance I you know um, I photograph for farmlands and PGG rights and, and, and you know those sort of shoots don't um, the style that uh, of Photography that a like it does doesn't suit that sort of mass market look, okay. and I just couldn't see them wearing or trying to right. change. It just wasn't worth the risk. So, so I guess it's so it, always it, it's a balance. Been a, is... it, it has it, like it has been a, a learning curve shooting with a camera like that because you do have it's, it's just a whole different mindset, um, and it, it sort of reminds me a little bit of taking that jump from film to digital which for me was a massive I held off as long as I could and was that more because you were comfortable in the you know in the in the film canister world or more 
probably did. The, the fear of like having to retrain in that that area, or that it just wasn't good enough at the time. Well, I suppose when you you, I was probably in that era where, um, you, if you knew you were comfortable with film, when I could do, you know, I just knew film like the back of my hand, and then digital comes in, and I wasn't really that computer literate, and probably it just made me really nervous about a whole change okay so and i think it was steve smith said to me from craggy range and i was shooting Cra- i've shot craggy's right through and you know used to, we used to shoot it all in film and he said when are you going to change a digital and i'm like oh, no. you know and then you think shit maybe he's right and um yeah and it, i i think his comment made me think god i've got to take this seriously because now my clients are saying when you're changing and i did i, I bit the bullet and yeah haven't looked back really but um I'll, I'd never regret my film upbringing because it has made me a compose shots and b be very as economical as I can because I still do think even sort of 15 years down the track I'm still thinking I'm shooting film and I'm careful about my composition because I don't really like cropping and also editing on the computer like you can go and seed spray and take millions of shots and then you can put something together. Seed spray. That's I've never seed, heard that oh, term. Seed, I quite seed, like it. Seed spray, like yeah. you know, like a, <laughs> um, and edit back to give your client something that's acceptable. Where I, tr- I I try not to do that and try and make every shot a winner. And that's and that's that whole film thing because you knew, especially if you're shooting medium format film, every shot's going to cost you ten dollars or yeah. six dollars or whatever it was. So you you're if you're working for yourself, you're really economical on it. So. So do you think then, um, growing up in that period of time where you had to be economical for the, the very reason of how um, film was developed, that that process of you know, taking the shot and taking your time to get the exposure right and the composition right, does that give you then an advantage over you know, photographers that are starting in the digital age? Um, oh, I, I, or do you believe I, it's like pros and cons of... Well, I was talking to a friend the other day, and he's he's sort of similar to me. We're both saying, like, you know, you shoot transparency or, or slide film, and there was no tolerance. Like, you had to get the exposure absolutely bang on. Like, if you didn't, the shot was yeah. kiss it goodbye and probably kiss your client goodbye. So you were so careful with all your exposures. Where with digital, you've probably got this massive tolerance on each side you know you've probably got three or four stops on each side you know where you can get away or you can patch things up on photoshop where back in the day you had to be your exposure had to be bang on and yeah I, it's sort of i find that's hasn't left me and I th- that's what i do it, it's, it's interesting going through the, the whole film thing and then going to digital, I, I'm, I'm pleased I did it, although I'd like to be younger, but you know, it's sort of like a, um, it has, has been a good thing. Do you still do any on the or, film side now? It's all completely digital. Yeah. Yeah. Apart from we're going, at the moment we're going through a process of scanning a whole lot of old negatives um, to archive. I'm sort of decided to have yeah, stuff, yeah. stuff there that I think is sort of valuable. Oh, not not financially valuable, but as as I'll probably, you know, I'd say long term, I'll I'll end up giving it all to the to the museum or yeah. someone because it's. Um, I probably shot Hawks Bay for the last forty years, maybe. Well, it becomes a, a record of of time. Yeah. Um, my my great grandfather, um, he was a photographer, mm. and he had to go to war. Mm. He, so probably something you would want to do, and unless you go there, he was a, a medic. And um, you weren't allowed to take cameras back then because it was Gallipoli. Wow. Yeah. And he took the only photo of, in the first photo, of Kiwis landing at Gallipoli. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that was before f stops and shutter yeah, speeds. Yeah. And he hid the camera in his sock. Um, and if you go down to the the Anzac House, yeah. the photo's there. It's there. Um, it's oh, on yeah. it's on stamps and. Um, it's kind of interesting because yeah. that way back then was way before digital, and he gave three prints to each of his daughters um, and they've been passed down through the through the family so um, you know we're kind of having this conversation now of you know what do we do with the negative side of things and and I think it needs to go into the museum as well into National Archives who's got the negative Um, someone it's in the family yeah yeah yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, 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 well, probably my whole book thing is all about recording. I've, I've always liked to record things or, or you know, photograph for the thinking long term. I'll give them to someone, but yeah. And it's the value. So, it, it, the particular photos um, that you know you've got. I saw you posted one um, of you know where Common Room is now. Oh, the Dominion Fish Shop. Yeah. But when it was yeah the original yeah. the fish shop back in the you know the nineteen yeah. eighties. When I worked at Aerial Mapping, we used to go in there every Friday for for lunch. We'd go and have fish and chips in there because they had the, they you know do the classic big fish and chip plate you know and a big pile of white bread. You know the whole was probably. Yeah. It would kill you now, but uh, you know it was. Um, that was where you went. We did it every Friday lunchtime. That's it. Yeah, it's sort of a. It's great. It's gone back to being a bar. Yeah, but it's a shame it sort of got rearranged in the middle somehow. It's, it's a shame no one took it over. Oh, as is. As is, yeah. and kept it going. Or the common room. Yeah. Okay. Because it's a pretty amazing space. Do you get to spend much time back there, or are you on the the road a lot? Um, with I um, I go away. Ooh, yeah, I am quite away a lot. I do a lot of work in Auckland in the film industry, so I do stills and um, behind the scenes shots for screen time. So um, I start on a film on the third of October for two months, and then start another one mid January, I think, for another two months. In Auckland, but it's normally about three or four days a week, and then you come home. No commute, sort of commute. Yeah. What, what does that mean when you're when you're on film sets? In my mind, I'm thinking they're shooting a film, not not stills. Yeah, but they they, they need sort of stills for like websites and or any of their marketing, ah. billboards, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's where I and it, it, yeah, I work for the, I've worked for the same director for about six years now, I suppose, and he get on really well so it's great you know if you get, have a good relationship with yeah the key guy then he requests you every time so I've, I've, I've done lots of work for them but I probably get three films a year which is amounts to I think I did last year I did about 90 days in Auckland I think yeah do, do you get Auckland. on set do you get to have your own creative influence that no. this is it's all you, you basically look at a mon you watch a monitor and you s watch the scene being because I normally do two or three takes but you I always watch the first scene and then work out what uh. the key parts are the what playing and then the director will say will point out this is what I want and then I've I've got what you call a sound blimp on my camera so it's like a big housing on my camera which silences it so I can shoot while they're filming otherwise you just get kicked off you're out. Or you have to shoot the rehearsals, or that. so yeah. which is always. It's not the real thing. The great shots are the ones when they're actually because they're putting their heart and soul into it. If you do it right at the end, they're just like oh, over it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's sort of quite a big, a major part of my business really. And then you also do the portraits of the actors, and yeah, so it's, it's a really good job. But the thing, also all the lighting set up, everything's you shooting. The same as the films yeah. going to be. So you, um, it's an it's a interesting because I've learnt lots about lighting on film sets because they are, you know, they do it a different way than still photographers. But it's a what style I really like. What's the difference between the two? Um, a, you've got a hell of a lot more equipment than you've got access to as a still photographer. Um, and it's not flash. It's you know, it's yeah. When I see you around, though, taking photos, you don't tend to carry a whole lot of photography uh, equipment. No, I try not to. I, I, with my lighting, I've got one. I've got a pro photo kit, which is just a single head, and that's all I use for portraits. And I, I just like the single lighting, which gives, which gives drama. Um, and camera, I've, I've just got two lenses on both cameras, and that's a. a I try and keep it to a bare minimum, and for try and sort of make my work. To suit, uh, well, I don't know. That doesn't sound quite right, but I do shoot. I'm not into big long lenses and stuff like that. I just try and. I think you should be able to. Um, what's in here? You should be able to put. Yes. Create through the lens of your camera, and if you're starting to distort things or play around with them too much, it's. It doesn't it's preserve. What's come from here. The feeling. Yeah. 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 And I, that's what I, I really like. That whole. Um, quite a photojournalistic style, maybe, or um, 
I don't like things too staged, and I'm saying that if you know, a film is staged, but if, yeah, I just sort of like to shoot as things are. What are some of the most um, you know, iconic for you personally photos you've taken or areas uh, or trips you've been on um, where you know, you've come back and gone, wow, you know, that, that it blew even me away? Um, lately, the last one was um, I've been in the Philippines this year and for the last four years um, I go and stay with a friend over there and uh, I've always said to him I want to go and it, we went to an exhibition about four years ago in Manila and a, a photographer had photographed this tattooist who's like 99 years old she's 100 this year Wow. anyway we saw this portrait about five years ago and I said to David I, I want to go and see her and she's up in the mountain province like you're talking a massive effort to get there and I go, I go to the Philippines every year for work and um, or to, and visit my friends. And every time I just don't quite get it together to, to go, go on go the, to this, the trip. Go to the big mission. And this year uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to do it. And um, Sue and I went, we, yeah, we decided to make the trek. And it was, it was about a 12 hour drive from Manila and then yeah for your hike up into the mountains or in, into this village and um she's like 100 well 99 years old and does traditional um filipino tattoos which are uh, very tribal looking but uh, yeah she's yeah amazing so i managed to i i had communication with her granddaughters by email and facebook actually and they'd sort of said, well, just as soon as you get here, or when you get to the Philippines, make contact, which I did. And then they said, well, when you get here, well, I've organised for you to have lunch, and if you want to stay, we can sort something out. We didn't end up staying up there because I wasn't feeling so good. I sort of had a bit of similar to what was happening in Havelot North. <laughs> so, but we, we spent the day with her and had lunch with her, and I managed to photograph her in that time. And it was amazing. It was like she had an aura that I don't think I've ever... Uh, I had an interpreter with me, so he was sort of um, letting me know what she was saying, obviously, but it was just, it was really, yeah, something about her for a hundred year old woman who was tattooing all day, starting at 6.30 in the morning and finishing at 7 at night. Wow. With all these, the just queues of Filipinos there, or from Singaporeans that wanted a, you know, wanted the Filipino tattoos, and from her, because she's quite famous. Um, yeah. It was something else. And that, that portrait still, I look at it and go, oh my God, it's on my Instagram. I think I put it on Instagram or Facebook. But it was one of those portraits that just her face said it all because we got her halfway through the day. She'd already been working since 6.30 in the morning, non-stop with no breaks. And she was absolutely shattered, but she still had another seven or eight hours to go. Unbelievable. And we sort of sat in her little hut and she, she was you know eating her rice and stuff. And she just said, you, you know, photograph and look and yeah she just let me do whatever I wanted you know photographically and it's, it's amazing but that, that's one sort of memorable portrait um, what else uh, just trying to think what other I've, yeah there's a few there that another shot is I did a book on Jeff Thompson years ago and, and photographing some of his sculptures and there was one which is on Alan Gibbs's farm and Helensville, I think it's, was it Helensville? He's got, he's got a sculpture farm out the back of Auckland, which is absolutely beautiful. We flew in there by helicopter, the whole shaboodle. But he had a, he had a herd of Jeff Thompson cows in a paddock, which was just amazing. And then this other cow just sort of nudged in, and I got the shot of this cow sort of just like nud, nuzzling against this corrugated iron cow. It was just one of those shots, you think, like all of us were going, Oh my god! And I had the camera. I was, I was all set, tripoded up, the whole thing, and it just walked. It, this cow just walked into the frame. <laughs> and it looked like it was sort of going to shag it, but this could go really badly real soon. But I'm going to get a shot. And um, yeah, so that was sort of another one. Mm. Sometimes in, in photography, it takes that little bit of magic where you can't plan for it, just having to be at the right place. There, at the right there time. is a fair bit of luck. There's no doubt about that. You know, like it, luck or yeah. I think those shots that um, 
And I suppose Facebook or Instagram, you know, they're full of them where you just this weird things that have gone on, which is obviously luck that you've had the camera pointed in the right direction at the right time. But yeah, it's nice to have some control, especially lighting, you know. Yeah. Portraits, I like to have sort of a, a reasonable amount of control with lighting. Because there's nothing. We, I, I sort of find if your eyes aren't sharp or lit well, then the portrait's out the window. And that's my traditional upbringing. That, to focus on the eyes. Your eyes have got to be sharp. Like if you're, you know, off quite often, your know, nose might be sharp or the ears are sharp or your eyes are out. And it, to me, it's just like, phew, ditch. It's all over. over. It's over. Yeah. And that's my sort of. You've photographed a few people um, on the show as well. Uh, I think yeah. uh, Freeman, uh, White, yep. Yep. Uh, Fane Floors, yep. uh, Kent Badley. Yeah, Kent. Um, and you know, they're all artists in their own, own domain yeah. as well. And I think. Um, what I've got from uh, each of them is that you know if you do keep on practicing your craft enough, yeah. you do tend to have more of those lucky moments because yeah. you're out there doing it more. Would that be something that you know you've subscribed well, to? I do. I, I'm a big believer in the more you shoot, the better you get. And it, it, photography is like any other practice. Um, you, you know, if you're an athlete, if you didn't practice, you're not gonna you're going to fail, like, unless you're an absolute freak of nature. And I think, I, I do believe photography is the same. Like, I, I, I take my camera out every day and just wander around and probably try and get something out of, out of a bad situation. Or, and, and you always learn, like, you know, shooting straight into the sun or whatever. You know, you, if there's a way of doing it, you can make something cool out of it. But, um, no, I'm a firm believer in if you don't practice, you ain't going to get it right. So what advice would you give to someone um, who's just starting out in photography? Um, there's, a, there's a girl that does my transcriptions for these, yeah. for example. She's bought a, a camera for the first time this year. Um, and she's, she's right at that, that early edge. She's done, yeah. the, you know, done the iPhone stuff and mucking around yeah. and, has take, and actually got now a digital SLR and is going to go travelling. What, you know, what should she be focusing on to get the um, most out of... Uh, her equipment or, or you know the, her photography. Uh, well, passion. obviously you've got to be au fait with your gear. Like you've got to know what's going on with your camera. And I think if, the more you understand your camera, the better your shots are going to be. Um, but just taking lots of photo. Well, you know, without seed spraying, but you know, take lots of photographs, but actually think about them before you shoot. Like don't shoot for the sake of it. Actually make each shot. As if it's going to be your last, maybe it, that's probably a bit. Go scientific on it. Yeah, you want to think about every shot you're taking that it's going to be sold. You know that. Well, that's how I think because I know I'm, I'm mainly shooting for clients, but or I'm shooting for myself, but I potentially could be selling it. You know, it's. Um, I, I always look through my viewfinder and go to each four corners and to see what is in there and work back because and I try and do that really fast so that you can get rid of anything that's pissing you off or you know like if you've got your if, if you it, it, I think in your frame and your viewfinder that should be potentially the shot you want to finish with so you don't want to be dependent on Photoshop or cropping too much um, but that'd be my advice: is to, to actually think about everything you shoot, but to, but do take a lot of photographs, like it. But okay. use your brain. And then on the, the flip side of that, and that's great advice um, for photographers that have been in the game for uh, you know some time, mm. um, and are now finding you know anyone can get access to some pretty yeah. amazing equipment. Yeah. Like, you know, I've been shooting on this uh, Canon yeah. 80D that's here. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's not that hard to get great equipment for anyone now, so mm. how does a photographer then stand out when you can't do it on um, capital investment and the photography equipment alone? Well, it's sort of, it is, that's a good point because it is interesting because you sort of, a Hawke's Bay is an, an interesting one because you have got lots of photographers in Hawke's Bay. Um, I'm probably lucky because I do have a really lo loyal clientele and most of them aren't from around here, but it's still, you need to... I try and shoot from my heart, really, so that, you know, I do, for every job I do, I try and do something a little bit different that I wouldn't have done for the previous shoot, or, and probably smooth people. <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> relationships. Yeah, yeah, relationships are pretty important. Because some of the, 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 the people you shoot, particularly on the business side, they, they let you right in. It's almost like you're your family. Yeah, a little bit. I'm probably quite lucky in that respect, but I do tread lightly. I'm very careful and respectful of people as best I can. Yeah, it's a fine balance. It is a little bit because you don't want to upset people. That's for sure. Especially shooting people, you don't, and, or a function or whatever. You don't want to be the guy that no one wants to invite you to. You know, you want to be the one that's they like to see you there. You know, and that, if if you get to that, not I'm not saying I am, but I do try and be like that because. The more welcome you are, the better shots you're going to get because they accept yeah. you. If you're upsetting the crew, then you're not going to get the shot. So it's that fine balance between feeling and being welcomed yeah. without stepping over and becoming one of that that environment or that, that yeah. scene. Yeah, and it's um, that's sort of I don't know, probably my wedding upbringing maybe I learned a lot of how to deal with people quick or assess the situation so so Not last that I've got it right every time <laughs> so <laughs> but, like, you know that's yeah. probably the, the wedding thing definitely helped for assessing a scene quick and then making a judgment call on how to how to deal with because weddings are interesting because you do have high um, a, you've got a, quite a bit of pressure on to get it right. B, you've got some fairly, you know, you've got potentially a bride that could blow it, in, you know, because of stress involved. Got and it. So that's actually part of how you, so the portrait photography becomes relatively easy in comparison because that's only one person's por- por- emotions. Yeah, yeah, and portraits are, weddings are different because um, you've got that one day, it's a one day event, you know, a portrait, if you've got it wrong, you can always go back if you had to. But that's not the attitude, <laughs> and I'm not saying for the newbies out there to try and do that. But um, yeah, but you know that I, I learned a lot from because I, you know, weddings are, are you do have to deal with stuff really quickly, and I, I learned it's a great way to for the rest of your practice to yeah, especially with people. But I don't do too many weddings now. But it's um, yeah, it's okay. an interesting one. So last question before we, we finish up here. Um, what's on the the plans for the coming year? You know, what are, what have you got coming up that you're you're excited um, about? What have I got coming up? Those two films, obviously. They, I'm looking forward to them. They'll be great. Um, mm. Potentially an exhibition. I've got a little show coming up in November at MTG. In conjunction with a sound technician, um, which is Landscapes in Hawke's Bay. I won't say too much about that, but that's November, I think. Um, what else have I got coming? You've got a few things. I'll, I'll go back to the Philippines. I, I go back every year to the Philippines, but I want to. Go, I've planned to go up there and stay in that village for a few days, and just everything about it is wacky and weird, but I quite like that. So I thought. I want to explore that a little bit ah, further. Get a tattoo, maybe? Uh, well, I, I got part of one on my trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From the 99-year-old? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. She decided she wanted to sign me, so, yeah. So you're, you're a signature work of hers now? But I need a signature without the work. <laughs> <laughs> so my, the dri- my friend who was the driver for it, he's, he drove us up there. Um, yeah, him and I ended up getting the tap, tap, tap with the bamboo. But not not the whole thing? No, no, we didn't do the whole thing. So here, that's a quite a painful way to get a tattoo. It's really painful. <laughs> Especially without any anaesthetic like beer or anything. But it was, um, mm. Ouch. Well, it's, but um, yeah, yeah, so that, I don't know. Yeah, I've got a few little projects next year, but it's... Um, I want to do another, another book on Hawke's Bay... Uh, which I'm quite excited about. As a personal project? As a personal project, but I want to... The Cranford book was was great and I really loved it. Um, But there's sort of some nitty-gritty shots that I probably couldn't put in there. And I I think a personal book, and if I do it 
if it doesn't sell, it's not going to break me. But it's it's sort of the real, yeah, that's what I'm quite looking forward to, getting that out. And that'll probably be mid next year by the time we do it. But it, it's more of a photo book without too much text and too many, you know, it's just a book of pictures really, but yeah. Excellent. So that, that's well, the plan. Um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what you do on the, the book side of things. Yeah. I'll definitely be along at the uh, the MTG. That yeah. sounds quite interesting with a sound technician. That's really interesting, um, actually. And, and that's only just happened in the last two or three weeks. It's, it's been an interesting little project there. Some really good creative stuff happening in Hawke's Bay. And, oh, I um, think so. And and good galleries now. Like, you know, you've got... Um, a space around the corner. Sp space is fantastic. Like, that's really good. Um, and then down the road, we've got Annabelle. Anna, Annabelle, who's got... In a paperwork, she's moved out to Te Wonga here, so she's just right. up the road. And then you've got Parlour Project in Hastings, which is amazing. Um, and the, obviously the main galleries, and two or three others in Napier. So it's sort of, you know, from having pretty minimal gallery or arts, it's um, coming about, which is good. It's an easy way to help people get into appreciating art when there's yeah. local retail places or yeah. areas where you can go in and just enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Richard. Pleasure chatting. If you like this episode, remember to subscribe for free on iTunes. Simply search for The Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes Store.